Someone bought me a t-shirt with that, with that phrase on that, okay, after I, after I talked about that. It's always a negative phrase. It's never positive. I got pulled over. I got a ticket. I can't get out of it. Help me. It is what it is. My boss, she's a real jerk. The environment at work is horrible, but I can't quit. It, it, it is what it is. Yeah. Oh, man, my husband, he's a moron. <laughs> it is what it is. Not, not so loud, honey, not so loud. My basement flooded. It's so wet out there, help me. It is what it is. It is what it is. But this morning, I want to talk about a positive, a positive about this phrase. Like I told you, I couldn't, I couldn't find much ways to make this, this phrase positive. Now, after that, people came up to me, and they're like, no, no, it's very, very positive. I said, okay, when do you use it positively? Ah, uh, uh, it's sunny out, it is what it is. I said, no one ever says that. No one ever says it is what it is it, with, with the sun outside. But this morning, I want to speak about the Word of God out of Hebrews chapter 4, verse 11, 12, and 13. And I'll present this title to you this morning, The Word of God is what it is. It is what it is. It is the Word of God. I want to talk about the Word of God this morning. The Word of God, it's inspirational. It's blessed. It's enduring. It's accurate. It's unending. It's life-changing. It's sin-defeating, bondage-breaking, home-restoring, children-rearing, conflict-resolving, hope-restoring authority. It is the Word of God. It is, help me, what it is. It doesn't matter what you think of it. Help me. It is what it is. It doesn't matter how you treat it. It is what it is. It doesn't matter if you ignore it or embrace it. It still is. The Word of God is what it is. Look with me, please, in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 11, 12, and 13. Let us labor, therefore, to enter into that rest, lest any man fall after the same example of unbelief. For the Word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even through the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Neither is there any creature that is not manifest in his sight, but all things are naked and opened under the eyes of him with whom we have to do. The Word of God is what it is. This morning I'd like to look at the, what the Word of God is, and tonight what the Word of God does. I believe that the, our interaction, our belief in the Word of God will either dictate a positive blessing on our life or bring about an unending condemnation on our life. Because the Word of God is what it is. Lord, I thank you for today. I thank you for your Word. Lord, I pray for your help and your blessing. Lord, I pray that you would help me to say those things that would be profitable this morning that would be true to this passage of the Word, Lord. Lord, I pray that for the blessing that your Word would go forth and not return void. You've promised to bless and uplift your Word. I'd ask that you would do that today during this service, Lord. And I pray for those folks here who have some real needs, Lord. They're folks who are hurting, who need hope, and who need life in you. I pray that they would recognize your Word brings that today. In Jesus' name I ask. Amen. This verse, Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12, is a very familiar verse. Often a Christian and, uh, will know this verse and have quoted it for different, for different things. Maybe you memorized it growing up. We've memorized it in our school. I grew up in the Awana program, uh, and I memorized this verse at a very young age. In fact, I don't remember exactly when I memorized this verse, for the Word of God is quick and powerful. But like I've stated, and like I'll state again, often these verses, the problem is not that we don't know them, but that we don't do them. This verse, as we come to this verse, we can at first say, well, wait a second, Pastor Howell, I know this verse, God's Word, is, it's alive, it's powerful. We're going to look at those things. But there's found in these three verses, I believe, some great truths that will help shape and form our life. I fear that in 2019, though we claim to believe the Word of God, we are far from following and actually truly believing the Word of God. What we believe, we will do. We can say one thing, and we can say we believe it, but if we don't follow it, we don't truly believe it. We can say that we love it. 
But if we don't read it and study it and follow it, then we don't love it. And while we claim things about the Word of God and about our belief, I believe that our lives show a far different story. I believe our lives show that the Word of God too often is just another book. Oh, a book that, that, that we carry around more than other books. Books that we perhaps read more than other books, and we have more copies from between our phone and our iPad and the copies in our house and our car and, our, and, and countless other places. But the Word of God was, was never made, never given just to be carried around. The Word of God was, was, never, was never given to us just to be presented as a gift sometime and after you win a contest or a prize. The Word of God was given to learn about God and to know God Himself. We look at the Word of God this morning. The Word of God is what it is, first of all, because of its divine author. This book is a divine book, the divine author. It, the, the Word of God, that word logos, word, and theos meaning God, it, denoting divinity. Peter answers this question in 2 Peter, when he, or 1 Peter, I'm sorry, when he says this, For we have not followed cunningly devised fables, when we have made known unto you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but were eyewitnesses of his majesty. For he received from God the Father honor and glory when there came such a voice to him from the excellent glory, this is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. And this voice which came from heaven we heard when we were with him in the holy mount. And then he says this, we have also a more sure word of prophecy. Speaking of the Bible. Peter says, listen, this book that, that we're giving, this more sure word of, of, of prophecy, all right, is not just some cunningly devised fables. It is not just a collection of stories that have been passed down from generation to generation to generation. This book that we have, God's Word, Logos, Theos, is not just a book of man's opinions or interpretations. It is the Word of God Himself. If it was man's book, it could be ignored. Listen, we all ignore different things that men say to do. For instance, the speed limit signs. Too often they're suggestions, fast or slow, they're merely suggestions. How about the greatest command known to man, the implied command? Not of the Bible, greatest command. Here is the sign, wet paint. What do you want to do? Is that really wet paint? It doesn't smell wet. It doesn't look wet. Only one way to know. I can't help my come back little finger. You know, you touch that wet paint. Here's the deal. I grew up with my dad painting. We painted a lot of things. I had a lot of people touch wet paint. It's better not to put a wet paint sign up. They're like magnets. People come to you, um, sorry, Brother Howell, um, that, uh, <laughs> the wet paint, uh, I touched it. There's a mark in there now. No doubt there's a mark. You put your grubby hands all over it. Wet paint. See, if this was man's book, it could be ignored. If it was just an ancient book, we could put it into a museum. If it was just an interesting book, we could find it in a library. If it was just a storybook, we'd file it under the fiction, but it's not just a story or interesting or ancient or man's book. It is Logos Theos, the Word of God, divine author. God himself gave us these very words, inspired, God-breathed, given to us to live, to love, and to hold on to. I see from that a couple of things. I first of all see because of the divine author, I see authority. The Word of God, by the very nature of that definition, the Word of God, authority is accompanied with that. God's Word brings authority. A divine author brings divine authority. God's authority is revealed in His revealed Word. A while back, there was a, a man going around, I believe it was Flint, in a fake police car with a fake light in a fake uniform giving out fake tickets. They eventually caught this guy, and, uh, and apparently you can't do that. Who knew? 
Who knew? You can't, can't impersonate a, a police officer's. But if you got one of those fake tickets and went to the courthouse to pay it, you wouldn't have to because there's no authority. There's nothing, it's just a nice piece of paper. Along those lines, I saw something where they have what's called the parking police, and they do these things to people who park incorrectly at places. Does that, does that annoy anyone else besides me? And I saw these things, they wrapped one car, it looked like in this heavy-duty saran wrap. And then they stayed away and filmed while they had to, well, this guy had to tear it off his car. He parked, he double parked, the other guy parked up on the curb. I mean, they did crazy things. At school, every, every once in the 10 years or so, someone brings a note in that is, does not match the other signatures from their normal parental units. You know, dad signs this way, and this one is in big block letters, signed dad. Yes, my child can eat treats at lunchtime, signed the, the father figure. This is not the son in parentheses. There's no authority from that. But see, because there is a divine author, there is divine authority in the Word of God. That means this is not just uh, someone's opinions. This is God himself saying things that I must listen because there is divine authority. You can choose to ignore the authority. It, it doesn't in any way reduce, inhibit, or stop the authority. It is still there because the Word of God, help me, it is what it is. You can say it doesn't matter. People do. You can generate any excuse you feel to be valid, but the authority of, word God, of, of the Word of God still stands because of the inherent quality, because of the divine author. The Word of God is divinely given. It is the Word of God Himself. There's authority. There are people out there that say, this is old-fashioned, and they're right. It is old-fashioned. It was given a long, long time ago. That doesn't mean it doesn't apply today, but it is old-fashioned. That's absolutely right. They'll say, well, it's just too ancient. You're right. A marvelous thing the Word of God is, but the authority is there because of the authorship. It's divine author, which means divine authority. But I also see divine accuracy. Divine accuracy. In 1 Corinthians, Paul says, For God is not the author of confusion, but of peace as in all churches of the saints. Inside of 1 Corinthians chapter 14, they're talking about speaking in tongues, and they're dealing with some revelation, some things that God has given. And, and, and there Paul talks about, listen, God does not author confusion out there, but he authors clarity and clearness and accuracy. You see, God cannot and will not contradict himself, not in his being nor in his word. People have tried for years to disprove the Bible. Can't be done. Why? Because of the divine author. If it was man's authorship, you could disprove it, but you can't disprove God himself. It is divinely accurate. I've mentioned before, but three languages, Hebrew, Aramaic, and Greek, 66 different, um, 66 different authors over three continents, and yet the Bible is still accurate and agrees inside of itself. The Bible is still true. You find out in the Bible that a soft answer really does turn away wrath. You find that out, Right? Husbands and wives, you find out that a soft answer really works. It is really accurate. You find out, you find out that the earth really is a circle. The Bible is accurate. You find out you can't number the stars. The Bible really is accurate. Oh, people don't like the accuracy of the Bible. You see, if the Bible's accurate, and all of it is accurate, there are some things that, that tell me what to do. But I've got this thing inside of me that probably you do too, that I don't really like people telling me what to do. I've got this rule, and it's for, it's, it's a rule, I don't have two, I have lots of rules in my life, but I have this one rule, it's around the office, it's, it's at home too, it's like this, alright, and men, you may want to adopt this rule. Uh, a, a while back, uh, my secretary came and she goes, listen, she goes, Pastor Al, you need to make this phone call and you need to say this, this, and this. All right? And so I made a rule and I said, listen, here's the rule. I said, the rule is that either you can call and say what you want to say or I can call and say what I want to say, but you can't tell me to call and tell me what to say. 
That's my rule. Short while after that, my wife says, hey, you need to call so-and-so, and you need to tell them this, this, and this. And I said, honey, here's the rule. You can call and tell them such and such, and I can call, but I will not call for you to tell them this. You can tell them that. That's just a rule I have in my life. I don't like people telling me what to do. Neither do most of us. Speed limit, wet paint, do I need to re revisit those ideas? Right? But the Bible is really, really accurate. It begins to describe uh, the way that, that my heart is. It shows me my inner being. We'll look at that, we'll look at what the Bible does tonight. But the Bible accurately describes me, and I don't like that picture. I don't like to find out that inside I'm a really selfish person, but the Bible's accurate. I don't like the fact that the Bible says I only think about me, but the Bible's accurate. The Bible says, as Paul says, that is in me, that is in my flesh, there dwells no good thing. I don't like that. I like to think that I'm a good person. But the Bible's accurate. It is what it is. Because of the divine author and the divine authority, there is divine accuracy about the Bible. It's accurate about the world. It's accurate about relationships. It's accurate about you. And it's accurate about me. The Word of God. It is what it is because of its divine author, but it also is what it is because of the divine attributes. You see in this verse, if you look at me, please, in verse number 12, for the word of God is, what is it? Three things, quick, powerful, and sharper than a two-edged sword. Quick, powerful, and sharper than a two-edged sword. That word quick means alive, it's living. What that means is that the Bible, because it is a lie, that's what the Bible says about itself, and it is accurate because it is the Word of God, that means it is as applicable today as it was 5,000 years ago. That means the Bible, as I read it, it can tell things about my life and it can touch my heart today just as much today as it can tomorrow and just as much in my life as in your life. See, the Bible, it says about itself, it is alive. It brings life, and it is alive. It can make other things alive as well. The Bible is a living book. Jesus, of course, is called the Word, and He is alive as well. John 1 tells us that. But the, but the Bible works in such an amazing way that, that as you read it, as you look at it, as you study it, there'll be a truth from God's Word that'll just, we say, touch our heart. Boy, I've been in the hospital. I've been among people who, for all reason, have no hope. Yet God's word brings hope. It's alive. It's alive. I didn't just bring the Reader's Digest with me. I brought the Bible with me. I've been to funerals that bring God's word. It's alive. But I've been to marriages. Guess what? You bring God's word. It's alive. I can use it at the school, in the schoolroom, and it's alive. You can use it around the workplace, and you find out it works because it's alive. It's applicable. It works today. I I've read Shakespeare's works before. Now, some of you look at me like, wow, you're a weirdo. It is what it is. <laughs> Slipped that right back in there, didn't I? And I could quote some of Shakespeare, but... It would no more mean anything to most of us than the man on the moon, right? And you go to a funeral and begin to quote Shakespeare. What's going to happen? Huh. Oh, Bruno. Okay, that's great. He's quoting Shakespeare. Yet the word of God is different, right? I've been to weddings. They've never quoted Shakespeare at weddings. It's not alive. The word of God, though, is alive. What is it? It's alive. It's divinely alive. The Bible says it's quick and powerful. That means it's effectual. It will have an effect on you whether you want it or not. The Word of God will affect you. It'll cause either tenderness or hardness, but the Word of God will affect you. It was powerful at creation. The Bible says that in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. And the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. And God said, and after that, creation happened. And God said, and creation happened. That word of God is powerful. May I recall your mind to the day where Jesus was at the tomb of Lazarus. And Jesus spoke, said. 
And Lazarus came forth. Heard a sermon once, great sermon. They said the reason Jesus said and called Lazarus' name, because if he had not called Lazarus' name, all the local tombs would have emptied. That's how powerful the Word of God is. Word of God is powerful at creation, powerful with Lazarus. It's powerful at healing and casting out of demons, powerful over, wind, over the wind and the sea. And the Word of God is just as powerful today as it was 6,000 years ago. The Bible says God's Word is powerful. The power of a word. The man who saw Ray Allen, a basketball player, champion, chip rings, and great basketball player Ray Allen on the golf course. He asked Ray Allen, he said, Ray Allen, what is the one word that has motivated you to your greatness on the basketball court? And he said the one word to him was preparation. He said, I prepared hard, I, I worked hard, I, I practiced hard so that when that moment came, I was prepared. He claimed the power of a word, and yet God's word claims the power of the words right here. And if one nothing word of preparation can propel someone to do great things in basketball, how much more can God's word, the divinely authored, divinely authoritative word of God, not generate blessing and things in your life and in my life? God's word is powerful. A gorilla would be over six feet tall, weigh over 400 pounds. I read about how to stop a gorilla. They say things like, fall on the ground. This is a great idea for a charging gorilla. They said, never, never, never run from the gorilla. Never show your teeth. Never raise your arms and try to look bigger. Scream and shout and never, ever thump your chest in return even as a joke. They said, overall, how to stop a charging gorilla. And this is the quote that caught me and made me chuckle. It's a really bad idea. It's a really bad idea. How do you stop the Word of God? It's a really bad idea. You can't stop it. It's alive. It's powerful. And the Bible says it's sharp. It's sharp. He compares it in there to a, to a two-edged sword. Now, we would identify one, but, but back then in that time frame, they would have instantly thought, I believe, of the Roman sword, which was sharpened on both sides. A shorter sword, maybe 18 or so inches in diameter, maybe a little bit longer than that. A sword, a broad sword, they, they would have been accustomed to seeing. And when the author of Hebrews would have said, the word of God is sharper than a two-edged sword, they could have identified quickly with that thought. They would have seen this device that cut both directions. This thing that would just cut side after side. You see, it talks about not in a physical sense, but in a spiritual sense, that every verse is a blade which is alive and powerful and can cut inside of me. It is sharp, but it's sharp in its purpose. And Paul in Ephesians says, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. It's sharp. Sometimes that sharpness pricks me and brings what we call conviction. It brings a feeling in my heart that says, well, you shouldn't have said that. You, you shouldn't have done that. You, you shouldn't have went that direction. And that's what we call, biblically speaking, conviction. That's the Word of God. I'm talking once to someone who was struggling with shoplifting. You know, taking things that don't belong to you. Apparently it's a major epidemic out there. You have cameras and people and talking about how they felt guilty when they, when they took something that didn't belong to them. Well, then the Bible talks about that. That's the sword that cuts. You see, the Bible cuts here and there, both sides. Every side is sharp. Every edge is sharp. Every verse is sharp. It's alive and powerful, and it is there for a purpose. A sword is a purposeful instrument. You don't say, hey, I'm about to eat my soup. Please pass me my sword. I'd like to make a phone call. Please pass me my sword. Welcome to my house. Here's my sword. I'm leaving your house now. 
No, a sword has a purpose. Tonight I want to look at what the Word of God does. That sword brings the purpose. But this morning I want to challenge us on the Word of God. The Word of God, because it's divinely authored, it must have a place in my life. You say, well, I've never, I've never trusted Jesus as my Savior. You know that the Word of God brings life? Jesus saves. We sang the song, then we sang it again for the choir. Jesus saves. What is he saved from? Well, the Bible says, and you hath he quickened, made alive, same word, who were dead in trespasses and sins. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. The truth is that all of us, before we've trusted Christ as our Savior, we are dead, spiritually speaking, and the word of God can bring life to death. It can bring life. By trusting Jesus and Him alone for salvation, He will make us alive again, bring us a purpose in life, take us home to be with Him in heaven forever and ever when we, when we die. The Word of God brings life. The Word of God also brings healing. See, the Word of God must have a place in my life and in your life. Maybe you're a Christian who's been saved for 45 years. You say, I, I love the, the Word of God. I, I read it every morning. We also read the newspaper. I love the Word of God. I, I listen to it, and you listen to Glenn Beck as well. And if we're not careful, we give those things the same platform that the Word of God gets in our life. And to our shame, often those things get a higher platform than the Word of God. We get more worked up about some political argument, some political thought, than we do about some verse in the Bible. We'll talk all day long about what's happened in Washington and never mention God's Word, though we claim it's divine. We claim we believe it and we love it, but the place we've given to it looks like the bottom shelf. The Word of God. It is alive, it is powerful, it is sharp, but we must give it its place. Why? It's God's words. It's God's Word. And, help me, it is what it is. Where is God's word in your life? Authority, place, or have you given it the bottom shelf? Lord, I thank you for your word, which is powerful, alive, and sharper than a two-edged sword. Lord, I thank you that we can look at it, read it, and love it. Lord, I would ask that you would challenge our hearts this morning. Lord, there may be one here who has placed the word of God, though we read it, has placed it on a lower shelf in our life. Lord, may we give you the rightful place. Exalt it like you've exalted your word. Lord, there may be one here today who has never trusted you as their Savior. They don't have that life that, that you bring, that salvation you bring. Oh, Lord, would we deal with that today? 